showing the contrast. Last week we saw the lost person. Okay, to this week, today, we're going to see the saved person. And why we have been radically changed if we're a child of God doesn't always mean we're going to live right, but we have the potential to live right, which we didn't have previously as a lost person. Uh, notice Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to begin in verse 20. He says, But ye have not so learned Christ. Being saved, we're different. We're not the same. And as we learn our knowledge of Christ, we, that will never lead us to live like a lost person. Christ never does that. To know Christ is to understand truth and a new way of living, isn't it? Uh, that's why the people are called Christians, Christ ones, or believers. They're followers of Christ. And so when you get saved, things are different. And to know Christ is to understand the truth that we are to live a new way than we previously did. We're not saved only to continue in our lost past condition. We are created in Christ Jesus unto good works, aren't we? Uh, there ought to be something coming out of us that God is producing in us. When we came to faith in Christ... And by the way, that's putting our faith in the death, burial, and resurrection, the gospel of grace. But let me say something about that. It goes from the mind to the heart. I read the Bible, I listen to somebody teach or whatever, and it shows me that I am a sinner. And I have no hope of myself. But then I hear the wonderful news how Christ died for those sins of mine. And he was buried and he rose again. And it leads from just being a historic fact to a heart condition where you say, he died for me and my sin. It transfers from just knowing about it to accepting it in your heart by faith. That was for me. And you believe in that gospel. And when you do that, we enter into a new realm of living. As a believer, now it's Christ, it's his life, it's his way, it's his truth. In the word of God that he's given us and is giving us this truth, he gives us an understanding about what he expects our behavior should be as a child of God. Being saved now, we're in the body of Christ. We're not to promote sin in our life. We're not to have sinful behavior in our life because it was that sin that helped nail Jesus Christ to the cross. And we should be ashamed of that. Amen? Amen. We now, out of love, out of a desire, out of a want to please God, we live for him. It's not the fact that he has a hammer, he's going to hit me over the head if I don't do what he wants me to do. It's the fact that he has stretched out arms with holes in his hands and his feet and his side. And he says, do you love me? That's why we want to serve him. It states in 1 Thessalonians 4.1, Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. And it should be your desire as a child of God to want to please God. Hebrews 13, 21 says this, make you perfect, mature in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. When we live for God, it is well-pleasing in the sight of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 15, he says, and that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. There ought to come a time in my life because I love of Christ, it constrains me, I have to live for Christ because I love him. Amen? And then Ephesians 4, 21, he says this here, if so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. In that that's not a question, it's a statement of certainty. 
It's referring to a past event that had happened in their life. These Ephesian believers here, it's very important, had been saved for a while. And they had been taught the truth. Matter of fact, the Ephesians were privileged to be some of the first that were taught the mystery body program truth. The Ephesians were. And they were to live by that. And that made them, because of God's truth being in them, that made them different from the world. It's when we study the word. It's when we put it into us. We have something the world does not have. We have the absolute truth and grace of Almighty God. And the world doesn't have that, does it? It states this, Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. And what does grace do? Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. 1 Timothy 2, 4 is on the wall here. It says, who will have all men to be saved. Now, is that the end of it? No. And to come unto the knowledge of the truth. It states in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as in, it is in the truth, the word of God, now get this, the word, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. And so the word of God does a supernatural work inside of us, doesn't it? It states in verse 22 that you put off the former conversation, the old man. I just want to look at that part for a second. The former conversation, the former lifestyle, the former behavior. Paul reminded us, by the way, didn't he, last week in verses 17 through 19 of what we were the way we lived our lives that excluded God. We lived as if God never even existed before we were saved. The old man was our position in Adam. It was our sinful nature, our sinful practice. Before Christ, we were defiled, we were depraved. Our flesh was corrupted and it controlled us. And the battle that we fight today, we still have that old flesh, that old man, <laughs> living inside of us. You see, I, not only do I have the old man, but I have the new man that God gave me. And these two are contrary to one another. And they fight against the flesh, against the spirit. And they're going back and forth. And that's what happens when you get saved. Now, what Satan does... He fans our flesh. He fans its corruptness, its uh, desiring to do wrong, desires of longings and cravings. And with those temptations, the devil, he sets up traps for us to catch us. It states in 2 Corinthians 2.11, he says this, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. His devices, his trickery, his traps, his deception in order to get us to fall. He's been successful in all of our lives one time or another. Amen. That's for sure. Now he says in verse 22, the last part of that verse, he says that you put off the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust there. That you put off the old man. Now, since being saved, we are no longer in Adam. Now we are in Christ. And even though sometimes we don't understand it, we take it by faith because the Bible says it. In truth, our new position, we have already in our position put off the old man. When God sees us now as a child of God, he sees us as being perfect. That's amazing, isn't it? In our position in Christ, we're perfect. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Ephesians 4.1 says this here. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. In other words, we are to bring our practice up to the position 
that we have in Christ. We should always be striving to do that. Colossians 3, 9 and 10. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. It states in Romans 6, 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So our position that's in heaven, in the eyes of the record legal books of God, we are perfect. That's our new man we have, but also we have the old man in us, and that deals with our practice every day. Our practice in our everyday experience, we're engaged with the old man and the what flesh's corruption. But now that we are saved, we have the potential for not allowing the flesh to take us down or to defeat us. Now remember, before I was saved, I didn't have the presence of God living in me. I didn't have the potential of saying no to the flesh hardly. Maybe a victory or two in my life, but most of the time, I'm controlled by the flesh. But now, because of God's presence in my life and the new man that I have, he's given me. Now I have the Holy Spirit in me. Now I have the potential. I can say no to the flesh and win that victory. Amen? Amen? And that should be encouraging to all of us. The old man, when we put him off, he has very little sway in our lives. And it's as we daily yield our life to the Holy Spirit in us, that's when things happen. 2 Corinthians 4.1 says this, For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh, in our everyday living. He says that should be revealing. Galatians 5, 16, this I say, then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. He tells us what's going on in verse 24 and 25. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections of the lust. And now get this, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. So if I'm saved, I don't need to, I don't have to walk in the flesh but now I can walk in the Spirit under His control, under His guidance for my life. Ephesians 6, chapter, verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the trickery of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. And what he's saying right there, yes, it's a battle. We still have the old man, but thank God we also have the new man. And because of that, as we yield to God and his word and his spirit, as we yield to that, we can win. I don't have to live ungodly. I can live godly. Amen? Now, Ephesians 4.23, first part says there, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. When first saved, our minds only knew the flesh's and the world's knowledge. And because of that, we must, we must now saturate, renovate our mind, our thinking with God's word. And it's as we learn God's truth, who we truly are in Christ, we also learn how we can defeat the old man and how to live new with God's help in our life. And as a matter of fact, it's only then that I can experience victory in my life. It's only then that I can live and please God in a godly life of practice. Now, 
I wrote this down so I wouldn't forget. You don't put on in your life what you don't know. Amen? You can't put in your life if you don't know about it. And that's the tragedy among many, many Christians. They just don't know what God says in his word because they hardly ever read what's in God's word. Amen? Romans 12, 2 says this, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. When I get saved, I have to start putting out things and put in things of God. Philippians 2, 5 says this here, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. You see, now I need to stop thinking the old way. Now I need to start thinking like Christ. And you search the scriptures, and they are they which testify of him. I'm to put him, Christ, in my mind. And the good news is our new nature that we receive from Christ when we get saved desires this. And he's there to help us if we're willing to surrender to him. But remember, renewing is a continuous process. It takes time and never ends. During our lifespan, our goal is to keep advancing. That's our goal. This day, I'm trying to advance for God. Tomorrow, I'm going to try to advance for God and thus, right? And it doesn't ever end. Once you said, I'm done trying to advance, they got you. You won't live according to the new man. You'll live according to the old man. And by the way, that's why we see different levels of Christian growth. You know, there are babes in Christ. They haven't had time to learn, but they're also babes in Christ, been saved for years, but because they hardly ever read the Bible, the Word of God, you know, and try to put it in their life or whatever, they're still babes. It's amazing you talk to Christians and people who should know by now, and they're still at the babe stage. Amen? Amen? And then there's the carnal stage, the carnal level. That's individual believers who are just kind of gliding through this life. You know, they put little effort into their relationship with God. As a result, they remain fleshly and worldly controlled. So if they remain that way, what do you think that's going to produce in their practice in their life? Worldly and fleshly things. Amen? Amen. But thank God there's the mature ones. Those are the individuals who keep on trying. They keep on pressing. They keep learning. They keep applying. When they falter, they make it right, and they just keep on going all the time. And they begin to handle life in a proper way. One of the things that breaks your heart, there's always sorrow in life. There's always things that happen to your life. But there are some people, the way that they mourn about these losses is that it's as if God does not exist. And that's wrong. We have a good God. We have a gracious God. And he's there for us. Yes, it hurts right now. Humanly speaking, it hurts right now. But thank God I have God. (laughs) And I'm not alone. And his grace will be sufficient. I can make it through this. I'm going to trust him. I don't understand why, but his ways and thoughts are higher than mine. Amen, Amen. and I need to trust him. Now, what level a person is, a Christian is in their life, it's shown by or it's demonstrated by their lifestyle, by their behavior, by their understanding of God's word. And I'm grateful that as a believer, I do have the spirit of God and I have the word of God. And that's vital. It states this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but we, we received the spirit which is of God. Why? That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. 
We have the Spirit of God living in us who illuminates our thinking, gives us understanding of what we ought to be doing in accordance with the Word of God. Plus, we have the Word. Psalm 119, verse 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The more the word of God you put in the, into you will help build you up not to give in to sin when it comes your way. Amen. Is that deep? <laughs> Very simple, isn't it? States 130, verse 130. The entrance of words <clears throat> giveth light, of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the simple. In other words, even if you're an idiot or you're stupid, the Word of God makes you smart. <laughs> Amen? It elevates you. And we have the Spirit of God, we have the Word of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine and reproof, correction for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God, lady of God, may be perfect, or matured, truly furnished unto all good works. If you put the word of God, yielding to the spirit of God, allowing him to teach you and work in your mind and in your heart, you can be a matured believer. And a matured believer will put off the old and will put on the new. Amen? Are you all saved? Anybody here saved this morning or what? Ephesians 4, 24, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and in true holiness. Now that we're alive and new in Christ, now don't miss this, we now have, we can do, put off and put on through Christ's strength, through the Spirit's help, through the Word's instructions, through the Father's love, we can stop sinful behavior and begin to live godly lives. And this is showing us a biblical principle that's so important for all of us. We're to stop our old sinful habits, the sinful places we go to, running with the sinful people we shouldn't be following the sinful fleshly desires connected to the old man. God says, stop it. That's what he says. And when I stop that, it's then through the learning new truths in Scripture that we replace what we have stopped of the old and put on what is new. Biblical, godly habits. Going to new clean places, running with clean people, having clean friends, having right godly priorities and truth and our new relationship with God. And when I have those things, I stop what I'm doing wrong, I learn what I'm supposed to do, and I apply it to my life. And when it's, I'm doing that, I'm experiencing the life Christ wants me to live. It states in Romans chapter 6, verse 11, Likewise reckon, uh, uh, yep, yep, it does. Ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 17, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, you were, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. Being then made free from sin you became the servants of or godly living. Real simple, isn't it? You know, our college students, they go off the college, our kids go off to college, and you just hold your breath. Because you know in the secular public universities, you know they're teaching a lot of garbage today. And the problem is, as they go there, they allow that to be a part of them. They allow that to be put in their mind, in their thinking, and they have put out the word of God, and they turn out the next time you see them, they're on TV with a crowbar trying to break a window so they can loot. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? Huh? But you have to make the break from the old to the new. I, I've shared before that as long after I got saved, as long as 
I stayed in somewhat contact relationship with my old friends that I care about, still do today. They're good people, just lost. Because they're lost, they want to do wrong things. But I realized something. The, the longer I had that association with them, I continued to falter. It continued to pull me back. And it wasn't until I say, okay, I'm making a break. I'm getting away from everybody so I can get a hold of God and do what he wants me to do. And when I made that break, that's when change began to happen in my life. And all I did was I stopped the old sinful habits. I put on new godly habits, and I began to live out what God wanted me to do. That's when I began to have victory in my life. And the good news is our new man, we get that when we're saved, he's holy, and he lives inside of us. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to automatically live a life that reflects Christ. But now the potential is there to live for Christ. Understand our situation now that we're saved. We are new in our position. All new perfectly, godly. In this life, though, We'll get to a level and we'll level off and then we'll get a hold of God and try to do better and we keep, we keep going. Paul said, I'm striving toward that perfection. I'm striving for to become what I am in Christ in my daily life. And that's what God wants from all of us. That's why inside of us there's such a struggle at times. As believers... I don't know about you, we look forward to one day we will be made perfectly whole. You know, sometimes I look at myself and I see the flesh and what a hindrance the flesh is to our life. Oh my goodness. And the depths of depravity it can take you to. It's amazing. There's no end to it. It's a bottomless pit. <laughs> but you know, until we're called up to meet him, we have to live with it. But one day we won't. It states in Romans 8, 23, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown with ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. My position, my soul, my spirit, perfect in Christ, but my body that's been left behind of Christ going to heaven still has the old man living inside of him. And I will not eradicate that until I go to heaven in the rapture and I drop it. It states this in Romans 8, 30. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. In other words, already in the purpose and will of God for a saved person is your final destination. That's a done deal. But until we get there, we have to live with some things. The world, the flesh, and the devil. We understand that we are now in Christ. We're identified with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection, we who have been saved. His resurrection, gospel, it has become mine. We have died with him. The wages of our sin debt has been paid. We have been buried with him. Our sins have been carried far away, never to return. We have been raised with him. We now have resurrection life but also we have the potential of having resurrection power that gives us the ability to put off the wrong habits and put on the right habits. It states in Philippians 3.10 that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Paul strove for, to have that in his life. And it's as we surrender our life to the Lord as we yield to the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us, working in us, and as we understand and follow the word's truth that honor and glorify God, we will have power. I love Colossians 2, 10 there. And ye are complete in him. 
You have enough to have the victory. Uh, you don't need all the counseling. You don't need all this and that. You have everything you need in Christ. Amen. Amen. And he's there. So somebody said, well, how do I put off the old, put on the new? Very simple, and I'm closing. You have to know Christ as your personal Savior. If you know, don't know him, you don't have the Spirit of God, you don't have the Word of God, you don't have these things operating in you. And thus, you're at your own strength, and you will fail. Has there ever been a time in your life where you realized you were a sinner and who Christ is and what he accomplished for you through the death, burial, and resurrection? Secondly, you need to understand the Holy Spirit's presence working in you. Understand, when you get saved, God comes and takes up residence in your body. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. That's why if we walk in the Spirit, we'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's because of his presence. Number three, you need to evaluate your actions with what the Bible says. I used to smoke. I got saved, and the battle began. I knew I couldn't be a good testimony. And God's word says, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. So I, did a, I quit smoking. I used to drink some, do a few drugs here or there. Then God began to say, listen, you need to abstain from all appearance of evil. So I put it away. Make your actions coincide with what the word of God has to say. Number four, you need to yield to God's word and apply it to your life. This week, this week, look at your schedule. Put something in there in your relationship with God. Have it in there. You reap what you sow. If you put it in there, what will you reap? You will, receive, or you will reap the godly life that God wants you. You'll please God. And number five, you're to have as your main goal is to please God. That's your main goal in life. You see, in my life, it's not making my wife good. It's not making my husband good. It's about me, myself, being what God wants me to be. And if I can be what God wants me to be, I can be a good husband and a good father, Amen. good wife and a good mom. That's where the work needs to be done. Amen? 1 Thessalonians 4.1 Furthermore, then, when we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us, how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. Let me ask you something. How is your life right now? How is it? Is it pleasing to God? That's what God wants from us. That should be our goal. It states in Psalm 40, verse 8, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. And the reason I can do the will of God is God's word is in my heart. Before Christ, Zacchaeus was a tax collector. After Christ, he gave a lot of money back to those people he had gouged. The Gadarian man, he was full of demons. Legion. But after he met Christ, he was saved, fully clothed, whole, and in his right mind. The woman at the well, before she met Christ, she had had five marriages, and she was shacking up with a man at that time when she met Christ. After she met Christ, she helped win a city to Christ Messiah. Saul of Tarsus, zealot, Jewish zealot, persecutor, but after he met Christ, he became Paul, the great apostle, the author of 13 books of the Bible. I think of myself. Before Christ, chief of sinners. <laughs> That's just what I was. But after Christ, 
Still have work to do. Carol will vouch to that. But I'm working on it. I can live godly for Christ now. You can change if you're willing to do it God's way. Put off the old. Learn what God wants you to do. Then you can put on the new. Father, we love you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for truth. And I just pray that, Lord, our people here, that they would understand the importance that if they want to have victory in their life, they want you in their life. They want to live a life that really pleases you. They have to put off the old man's habits and ways and put on the new man's habits and ways. And they can do that if they get in your word each day, if they pray each day, if they yield and surrender to you each day. It's possible to be what you want them to be. The world and the flesh has a lot of lights, enthusiasm, temptations. And so it's only their relationship with you and your word and the spirit. Can they say no to that and say yes to you? God, you deserve it. May we give it to you in Jesus' name. And everybody said? We hope that you received a blessing from today's broadcast. We would love to have you to visit us in person. You can watch us live and view past services on our website at gpnd.net. For more information, please visit our website or contact us by phone. Until next week, may God richly bless you is our prayer.